All right, welcome everybody. Um, today's speaker is Byron Wallace from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and he will talk about bilipsis embeddings. Uh, yes. Coming, please go ahead. Thank you very much for having me here and uh, for the great applause. Um, so, um, right, so let me start with some introduction on the problem. Uh, in general, the embedding problem is, says roughly speaking, you have a, a metric space. Can we embed it inside the Euclidean space without changing the geometry too much, without changing um, the metric? And this problem is interesting for two reasons. One comes from uh, applied mathematics, specific, uh, specifically big data sets, where the question is you're given um, a big uh, set of data points and you know there are the distances in between them. And the question is whether you can reconstruct these data sets inside a Euclidean space, right? For example, you take many points on a car, you calculate uh, the distances between the points. Now you got yourself uh, a set with some metric. Can you reconstruct the car from that set? And the other reason why this problem is interesting is from a pure mathematic point of view, where when you want to understand uh, a metric space, right, you can understand it better if you can uh, embed it in some Euclidean space, since uh, the geometry of the space of the Euclidean space is easier to understand. So um, now I have to uh, quantify what I mean the without disturbing uh, part. All right. So there are. The, the best type of embeddings, of course, are isometric embeddings, uh, where you don't change the metric at all, right? Uh, and the question is, which metric spaces can we isometrically embed into RN? Now, isometries are great, but they're also very inflexible. And here is an example. Clearly, as we know, if a metric space has uh, at most three points, then we can isometrically embed it in R2 to just form a triangle, right? But there exists a metric space with four points that you cannot isometrically embed in any Euclidean space, not even in a Hilbert space. And that weird metric space is given by the simple figure where here I have all, all distances. So if you get bored with my talk, try to prove that this doesn't embed in any Euclidean space. Yeah. It's not very hard. And because isometries are so inflexible, we uh, consider uh, a relaxation of isometries and we call this a bi-Lipschitz map. Okay? So a bi-Lipschitz map is a map that does not preserve distances, but preserves them up to a multiplicative constant. And the problem now uh, reads as follows. Uh, you have a metric space. Question number one, can you embed the metric space in any Euclidean space? Question number two, if you can do that, what's the smallest n? I mean, we understand, uh, we understand Euclidean space, but clearly we understand R3 better than R19, for example. And uh, the last question is more on the computer science uh, sides, uh, what is the smallest distortion of the, uh, of the bilipsis embedding? Often you can sacrifice the dimension in favor of uh, a smaller distortion. But I'm more interested in the first question and a little bit on the second. Okay, so a great tool that we have um, on this problem is the notion of the Aswad dimension. Uh, the Aswad dimension was defined by Aswad, uh, although in some literature it's called the metric dimension, is the infimum over all positive S, such that we can find a constant C that every ball can be covered by at most C capital R over little r to the S balls of at most, uh, of radii of most R. Uh, the definition is not too important. I have it here for our uh, convenience, but uh, what is important is uh, that the Aswad dimension dominates all other uh, types of metric dimensions, like the Minkowski dimension and the Hausdorff dimension. And for a great variety of metric spaces, 
such as self-similar metric spaces, which include Euclidean spaces, um, the Heisenberg group, and so on and so forth. Um, all of these dimensions are equal to each other. And perhaps the most important thing is that the Aswad dimension is a bi Lipschitz invariant, which means if you can embed a metric space into Rn, then the Aswad dimension must be bounded. And in fact, it must be less or equal than N because the receiving space Rn has a Aswad dimension N. So that gives us a necessary condition, right? If you want to bi Lipschitz embed a set, the Aswad dimension better be finite. But unfortunately, this condition is only necessary. It's not sufficient. Um, Sems and later Laxo discovered examples of metric spaces that they have bounded a SWAT dimension. And at least one of them, you can make the SWAT dimension arbitrarily close to one, um, that do not by ellipsically embed in any Euclidean space. And in fact, even worse, they cannot even by ellipsically embed in Hilbert. And before I present the first of these two examples, let me say that there is a curious phenomenon in this business. All the examples of spaces we have that don't admit a by ellipsis embedding in a Euclidean space also happen to not admit an embedding in a Hilbert space. So there was a conjecture by um, uh, Urs Lang and Konrad Plotz, it's still open, whether there exists a doubling a space of bounded Aswad dimension that embeds in a Hilbert space, but does not embed in a Euclidean space. And that is, this is still open. Okay, so the first of these two examples is what we call the Laxo graphs. So what is the Laxo graph? The Laxo graph is uh, a metric space, which is the limits of a sequence of geodesic spaces. So the first metric space is just the Euclidean line segment of length one. And the second metric space is uh, a geodesic space where uh, each of these segments has length one quarter, right? So if, for example, you want to calculate the distance of this point from this point, then you have to calculate this length here, and then you have to calculate this length here, and whichever is the smallest, that's the distance, okay? So it's a geodesic space. And then G2, uh, similarly, um, each line segment has length 116. And again, if you want to calculate, say, the distance of this point to this point, you have to calculate the lengths over all possible paths. And the smallest of these lengths is the distance. So what Laxo proved, though this example here that I present is actually due to, uh, it's a variation of the Laxo graph. And this example here is due to uh, plot and lang. Uh, but uh, what Laxo proved is that the Aswad dimension is finite, but the limit space, the Hausdorff limits of these metric spaces does not embed in any Euclidean space because it doesn't satisfy a simple geom geometric condition that Euclidean sets have. So that's one example of where things uh, can go wrong. Now, the Aswad dimension is not completely useless. It gives us uh, a necessary condition, um, but it can also provide uh, some embeddability if you snowflake the metric. So this is a theorem of Aswad, which says that if the Aswad dimension is finite, and even if the space itself doesn't admit an embedding, as soon as you raise uh, the metric to the power epsilon, then immediately you get an embedding. And this is one of the most counterintuitive results I've ever seen because when you uh, snowflake the metric, and by snowflaking, I mean, you raise it to some power epsilon less than one, then the space in a sense becomes more complicated. It's a SWAT dimension grows. So uh, it gets more complicated uh, from this aspect but it gets an embedding whether the, the more uh, simple version may not get an embedding. And uh, based on this theorem of Aswad, there is also another open problem. Uh, some people call it the snowflaking problem, 
where you ask the smallest receiving dimension for the snowflake metrics for the snowflake Euclidean space. And we call this snowflakes uh, because if if n equals one and epsilon is log three over log four, then uh, the space R epsilon uh, embeds in R2 and the embedding is the usual Van Gogh snowflake. So as soon as you've raised the Euclidean metric to the small epsilon, your line suddenly became a snowflake. And again, it's an open question to find this optimal receiving dimension for the snowflake spaces. When this is the conjecture that I have here in red, and uh, this has been solved only in two cases. The first case is when you're talking about the real line, uh, which was originally solved by a SWAT. And then uh, with Matthew Romney uh, some years ago, we gave an alternative proof. And the second case where this is resolved is when epsilon is very close to one, so that our snowflake space is almost Euclidean, uh, in which case, the optimal dimension is again uh, the conjectured one. Okay, so this was my uh, introduction. And uh, what I'm going to do is I will uh, present the results on the by Lips embedding problem in two directions. One is for sub Riemannian manifolds, and specifically the Heisenberg group, and two on uh, quasi conformal trees, which are metric spaces with. Simple topology and good geometry. Uh, but of course, this, this is a, does not exhaust the topic. Uh, there are so many results on bilipse embedding right now, they could easily fill up a book. All right, so first is sub Riemannian manifolds. Uh, and before I give the definition of sub Riemannian manifold, let me say that uh, one of the motivations is the easy fact that we can easily believe that any compact Riemannian manifold by Lipschitzly embeds in some metric space and uh, by Nash embedding theorem, you can actually uh, figure out the receiving space. You can do it in 2N. But of course, more important, this is, this is, a, um, this is easy to believe because locally a Riemannian manifold is diffeomorphic to Euclidean space. So certainly, locally that meets by Lipschitz embeddings. And one can actually um, get a better receiving dimension if you have bounds on the sectional curvature. Um, so this is uh, a result of Sylvester Erickson Bick, who proved that if you know that um, the sectional curvature is bounded, uh, then not only you can estimate, you can get a good estimate of the receiving dimension, but you can also get an estimate on the, on the distortion of the map. Right? If it curves too much, then essentially you have to uh, fold your manifold a lot when you embed it in RN. Uh, that's why you want a bounded sectional curvature. All right, so this is what happens with Riemannian manifolds. Now, sub Riemannian manifolds. Um, for those that they haven't heard this before, is a triple where you have an n manifold, a non-integrable distribution on the tangent bundle that we call the horizontal distribution, and a continuous inner product on the horizontal distribution. Uh, roughly speaking, the idea is that in a, a Riemannian manifold, you can move in any direction you want by paying some cost. But in a sub Riemannian manifold, there are specific admissible directions that you're allowed to travel, and only through directions you can travel. So the curves of, of finite length are the curves that they follow these specific directions. And you can define a metric in a very similar way as you do with the Riemannian manifolds. Uh, the only difference is that <clears throat> you're not taking all possible smooth curves gamma but only those that their derivative is in this horizontal distribution, okay? Again, you can, you can only travel along these specific directions allowed by the horizontal distribution. Uh, you find all curves 
following these specific directions, you find their lengths and you take the infimum. That gives you the Carnot Cara Theodori metric. Now, um, I'm going to talk about two sub Riemannian manifolds. Um, the first one, which in a sense is one of the most simple sub Riemannian manifolds uh, there are, is the Grushin plane. Uh, where uh, H has this given orthonormal base. So if I would like to draw the vector, so at each point, uh, you have one vector in the X direction and always is length one, right? But the closer you get to the Y axis, uh, the Y vector becomes shorter and shorter. So here you have a long vector, here it's shorter, here it gets, it's even shorter. And then when you are on the Y axis, you no longer have the Y vector. You can only move in this direction. So that tells us two things, uh, which are also illustrated by, my, by the picture here, which is due to uh, Colin Ackerman. Uh, the thing is that every curve that crosses, every, uh, sorry, every curve of finite length that crosses the Y axis must cross it tangentially. And also, uh, sorry, not tangentially, I mean vertically. Mm -hmm. And also, if you want to travel from a point of the y axis to another point of the y axis, you have to go out to one of the two half planes, the, the right or the left, vertically, travel there, and then come back uh, vertically. And in this picture here, uh, you see the, the geodesics between the origin and points on the y axis. So outside of the y-axis, uh, this is a Riemannian manifold, but the y-axis itself is fractal. And uh, in fact, uh, the Hausdorff dimension of the y-axis is two. Uh, actually, no, not two, uh, is, uh, what is it? It is alpha plus one. So it's fractal, the y-axis is fractal. All right, so Seo proved that when alpha is an integer, then the Grushin plane embeds in uh, some Euclidean space. And let me say that for those that have worked on sub Riemannian manifolds, you may uh, interrupt me at this point and say, what is this guy talking about? If alpha is not an integer, Technically, this is not a sub Riemannian manifold because um, the distribution is not non integrable. But that doesn't really matter. Uh, this is still uh, a metric space. But you know, technically, it is sub Riemannian only when alpha is an integer. So, uh, Seo proved uh, this result in their thesis. And then later, Yang Mei Wu proved that uh, when alpha equals one, which is what we call the standard Grushin plane, uh, then you can bilipsisly embed this in R3. And in fact, three is as sharp as you can get. You cannot do it in R2. And the reason why you cannot embed it in R2 is because the Y axis has, uh, is, a, is a snowflake, it's a one half snowflake version of the real line. And the y-axis cannot be embedded in R2. It has to be embedded in R3. So that's why the dimension is up. And one year later with uh, Matthew Romney, we proved that uh, the generalized Grushin plane can be embedded in uh, R integer part of alpha plus two. And for the same reason, the dimension is sharp uh, because the y-axis cannot be embedded in anything less than that. All right, um, I'm gonna skip this and uh, I'll go to uh, the next sub Riemannian manifold, which is the Heisenberg group. And this is perhaps the most famous sub Riemannian manifolds. There are several ways, there are at least three ways to um, define uh, the sub Riemannian, this, the Heisenberg group, and here I'm presenting only two. Uh, the first is geometrically, <clears throat> where you can um, present it as a sub Riemannian manifold that has a very specific uh, orthonormal basis. And uh, the horizontal distribution is in the picture uh, that I stole from Scott. Uh, 
Um, and I, this I shows uh, the horizontal distribution on each point of the plane z equals zero. But because the horizontal distribution is invariant under vertical dilations, that picture is the same on every plane parallel to z equals zero, right? So remember again, every curve of finite length must follow, must be tangent to, uh, to these planes at every point. Oh, uh, you know, not the original source of that. Okay, well, I have to find who to credit them. Um, then the other way uh, to define the Heisenberg group is um, algebraically, it is a multiplicative group of uh, upper diagonal matrices that they have one in the main diagonal and some norm, right? And then you can define uh, the metric here of uh, uh, two matrices to be uh, the norm of A minus one B. So these are two different ways to define it. And now about the embeddability of the Heisenberg group, the Heisenberg group was one of the very first spaces of finite Aswa dimension where things went really bad. Uh, so the Aswa dimension is four, but Sam's proved that there is no by Lipschitz embedding of the Heisenberg group into a Euclidean space. And I'm not gonna present the proof, but let me very roughly sketch what happens here. The idea is that if there was an embedding, uh, you would have a by Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group onto a Euclidean subset, a subset of, uh, of Rn. And by Rademacher theorem, actually it's not Rademacher theorem, it's Pansu theorem. By Pansu differentiation theorem, uh, that map, because it's Lipschitz, is differentiable almost everywhere in the sense of Pansu. There is a notion of uh, uh, derivative between Subramanian manifolds. And because F minus one is also Lipschitz, uh, F minus one is also differentiable almost everywhere. So you end up with sort of a diffeomorphism between these two objects and which, um, which uh, uh, further becomes a homomorphism between the tangent spaces. But the tangent space of the Heisenberg group is the Heisenberg group. And the tangent space of Rn is Rn. One is an abelian group, Rn. Uh, H is non-abelian, and this is where uh, the contradiction enters. That's very roughly what's going on. <laughs> Uh, so if you know uh, the Pansu derivative theorem, um, Sam's proof is short. So usually people credit both Sam's and Pansu uh, for that observation here. But as I said already, uh, there's this curious phenomenon where uh, if you cannot embed in a Euclidean space, you cannot embed uh, in a Hilbert space as well. Heisenberg group is not an exception. So the question that um, we explored with uh, Son Lee and Vasilis Kusionis and Scott Zimmerman is, okay, you cannot embed the Heisenberg group, but which subsets of the Heisenberg group can you embed? I mean, clearly, if you take a finite subset of the Heisenberg group, that admits an embedding, but is there any more substantial uh, thing you can say other than that? Well, for one, there is a type of sets that there is certainly no embedding at all. And these are the non-porous sets. So let me define what porous means. Um, porosity uh, says that uh, for every point in your set and for every ball of radius R, you can find another ball inside here, which does not intersect your set at all. So in other words, your set is like, a, Swiss cheese. It has holes on every scale, big holes on every scale. Um, so one can imitate the proof of SEMS to show that if a set is not porous, then it does not uh, admit a by Lipschitz embedding into L2. And roughly speaking, the reason is that if you if your set is not porous, then uh, either you can 
uh, blow up or blow down and see the entire Heisenberg group, uh, which uh, does not admit an embedding. So for example, if you take uh, all the points with uh, integer uh, coordinates and you put the Heisenberg metric, then that set does not admit uh, an embedding. And now the question is, okay, what if it is porous? And that's the first theorem for today. Um, we constructed with Kusjonis Lee and Zimmerman a porous subset of the Heisenberg group that does not admit uh, bilips embedding into L2. So that means the Heisenberg group is, uh, raw, is it's, it's bad for embeddings even, on, even for its smallest sets. And uh, roughly speaking, uh, this construction is a combination of the two bad examples that I have presented already. Laxo grafts and the Heisenberg group, right? So the idea here is to build a Laxo graph inside the Heisenberg group, though this time you're not using segments, you're using uh, geodesics. Uh, and if you build it carefully, you can make sure that, um, that it's not, that it is porous and the non-embeddability uh, actually comes more from the fact that it resembles the Laxo graph rather than that it's inside the Heisenberg group. So Heisenberg group contains very small sets where things can go wrong. Now, what about sets that do admit some embedding? Um, and uh, the result here <coughs> is the following. Uh, first of all, if you have a piecewise linear two manifolds in R3, for example, the boundary of the unit cube, then locally, uh, every point has a neighborhood that admits a bilips embedding into some Euclidean space. But unfortunately, here we know neither the dimension nor uh, the bilips constants. It really depends on how many faces uh, the two manifold has. For one manifolds, C11 manifolds, uh, similarly, we have a local uh, by Lipschitz embedding. Uh, namely, uh, each point has a neighborhood that the neighborhood by Lipschitz embeds in R4. So here we know the receiving dimension. And in fact, you can do it with a universal by Lipschitz constant. Uh, that means that this is independent of the manifolds of the neighborhoods or of the point. Um, and finally, two manifolds. Now, this is where things uh, get tricky. If you have a C11 two manifolds uh, in R3, then we cannot prove that every point admits a local by Lipschitz embedding, but almost every point. Okay? So almost every point has a neighborhood so that um, uh, this neighborhood embeds in R4 with universal by Lipschitz constants. And I won't go into the proof, but let me just say, what is the enemy here? Um, so the enemy is um, the characteristic points. Okay, we, a characteristic point on a manifold M is a point for which the tangent space is the same as the horizontal distribution. Okay, so for example, if you think of the plane, if M is the plane Z equals zero, uh, then at the, at the origin, right, the, uh, the tangent of M is the same as the horizontal distribution. So the origin is a characteristic point for uh, this specific plane. And these are the problematic points where we don't quite know what's going on. But the good news is that uh, these points are very few, hence the almost every part that I mentioned. Um, so basically, I'll just scan through the proof. Uh, basically, the idea is that for any point which is not characteristic, and we call this regular, we can find a neighborhood uh, of that point. So there exists a neighborhood of that point, which is by Lipschitz equivalent 
to uh, a snowflake cross an interval. So what we want to do uh, in this neighborhood is we want to use ODEs to foliate these neighborhoods into geodesics or horizontal curves, if you prefer. And then uh, there is um, the uh, dual foliation of curves, which are actually snowflakes. So you can prove that every neighborhood of uh, non-characteristic point is uh, by ellipse equivalent to a snowflake cross an interval. And well, the snowflake itself embeds in R3, the interval embeds in R. So three plus one, four. That's very roughly speaking, uh, the proof, but uh, I want to avoid proofs. Now, when you have characteristic points, um, we don't know what's going on in most of the cases. Uh, there are some examples where we can say a little bit more. For example, if you take a, a surface by revolution, so uh, say this is uh, the z-axis, and then you have a surface here, which is a revolution by the z-axis, then that point here is a characteristic point, but that's actually the only one characteristic point. Uh, and we know that um, we can embed neighborhoods uh, uh, in R4 with the by Lipschitz constant uh, depending on uh, how uh, fast uh, this uh, surface by revolution opens up. And that gives us a more con con concrete examples. One of them is the Korani sphere, which uh, by ellipsisly embeds in R4. And um, a more uh, complicated example is the plane, or oh, sorry, the surface Z equals XY over two, that doesn't have one characteristic point, like my previous example, but infinitely many, a whole line of characteristic points. And we are able to embed this in R19, which sounds terrible. And that's because we were uh, we didn't work too hard to make it better. Probably can be R4, but um, uh, we didn't care too much about the dimension. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about um, the Heisenberg group and the beddings there. Okay, so now I'm gonna move to uh, the more new stuff which is uh, quasi-conformal trees. All right, so what is a quasi-conformal tree? Let me first define a more well-known version, uh, the, the notion of a quasi-arc. So this is a very old notion. It goes back to Alfors and uh, Tuki and Weissala. So a quasi-arc is a metric arc that is uh, zero, one with some metric. Uh, that satisfies two conditions. One is that it's a SWAT dimension is bounded. And two, it has this condition where the diameter of the sub arc that joins X and Y is dominated by the distance of X and Y. So in other words, um, what this says is that no cusps allowed. Right, so if, for example, I define this curve here, uh, this doesn't satisfy the condition um, uh, that I'm asking here, which is uh, known also as bound determining condition, which is because if you take X and Y here, then uh, their distance is actually much smaller than the diameter of the curve that joins them. Okay, so quasi arc is. Uh, is an R metric arc of bounded dimension with no cusps. And then uh, a generalization of a quasi arc is the definition of a quasi conformal tree. So, quasi conformal tree is a metric tree. Metric tree means compact, path connected, uh, does not contain cycles such that it has bounded a SWAT dimension and satisfies a similar condition, namely uh, the diameter of the unique arc that joins X and Y is dominated by uh, the distance of X and Y. So 
Quasi-conformal trees can look like this, for example. You can have a snowflake, and then here you can have a segment, and maybe another snowflake here, another snowflake here. As long as you don't have cusps and um, you have finite as one dimension, uh, you get yourself a quasi-conformal tree. But this one, for example, this is not a quasi-conformal tree because there is a cusp. Okay, um, so quasi-conformal trees generalize quasi-arcs. In fact, a quasi-conformal tree with no branching is a quasi-arc. And geometrically, quasi-conformal trees is a generalization of uh, what people call geodesic doubling trees. Doubling here means that the Aswad dimension is finite. So this means that the Aswad dimension is finite. And geodesic means that any two points, for any two points, uh, the unique arc that joins them has length equal to the distance of the two points. Uh, geodesic doubling trees are a topic of research more on computer science and graph theory, much less in metric uh, geometry. But um, we should think them of, of the most simple versions of quasi-conformal trees. OK. Um, all right, so quasi-arcs, they have been abandoned in analysis. There is a, a whole book, in fact, of equivalent definitions of quasi-arcs by Fred Gehring. And quasi-conformal trees have also appeared recently um, in complex dynamics, uh, in random processes, and Lefner evolutions. Um, so they're not uh, actually rare. All right, so um, let's discuss now the embeddability of quasi-arcs before I get to um, quasi-conformal trees. Uh, the most simple example of a quasi-arc, or one of the most simple examples, is 0, 1 uh, with the Euclidean metric, but raised to some epsilon um, uh, less than 1. All right, so. Uh, this is actually uh, bound eternic. It satisfies uh, the condition that the, the diameter of any interval x, y is equal to the distance of x, y. That's easy to see. And, and as we know, the Aswa dimension of, let's call it x, uh, is equal to 1 over epsilon. So it is a quasi arc. And uh, I mentioned already, um, right? So by Aswad's, keep going. By Aswad's theorem that uh, we saw earlier, uh, this space embeds in um, uh, in R integer part of epsilon plus one, and the dimension. Oops, I have here two. That's a mistake. Uh, that should be integer part of epsilon plus one is sharp. But there is a a small caveat here. Um, the dimension is not sharp only in one case, which is the case when epsilon is one, which in this case, X actually embeds in R, not R2. Um, now, Heron and Meyer later uh, proved that if X is a quasi-arc and it's a SWAT dimension is less than two, uh, then we can bilipsically embed X into R2 and the dimension is sharp. Again, uh, there is a caveat here. If the SWAT dimension of X is equal to one, then maybe the receiving dimension could be one. Maybe you can embed it in R, maybe not. Um, and recently with um, Guy Davids, uh, we proved that every quasi-arc actually uh, embeds in a Euclidean space. 
and the dimension is sharp, again, with the same, the same caveats that if the Aswad dimension is one, then maybe you can embed it in R. Um, so let me very briefly say uh, what's uh, the proof, how the proof works here. Um, the proof is based on a construction of Heron and Meyer, where they show that every quasi arc is almost a snowflake in the following sense. That um, so let me actually restrict to uh, alpha to, to their results, to the case where the Aswad dimension is less than two. Uh, what they proved is that every quasi arc is by Lipsch equivalent to a snowflake built in the following way. You start with a line segment and you also choose some uh, P very close or some P between one quarter and one half. And you start with this line segment and then you have two choices. You either split the line segment into four equal pieces or you make a triangle where each of these lengths is equal to P. And then you iterate this procedure. Now you have four segments. So in each of the four segments, you either chop it into four pieces or you bump a segment. And the choices are independent of the segment you are. I mean, you can, for example, uh, chop this into four pieces and here you can make a bump. And maybe here you make another bump and here you chop it into four equal pieces and so on and so forth. So what Heron Meyer proved is that every quasi arc with a short dimension less than two is by Lipsch equivalent to one of these. So it embeds in R2. But um, if the Aswad dimension is bigger than two, then one has to make this construction much more carefully. The snowflakes that you build are no longer inside R2. They're in some um, higher dimensional space. You don't exactly make bumps. Uh, you construct them differently. But um, the, the basic uh, machinery is the same. And let me uh, conclude the discussion in quasi arcs uh, by saying that this condition that we had, that we don't allow cusps, is actually very important and it cannot be dropped. And this is an example. Think of a metric arc in R3 that goes through the entire uh, set of Z3 and you put the Heisenberg metric on this arc. Then you get yourself a metric arc which is uh, which has finite as what I mentioned. It does have cusps and cannot be bilipsisly embedded in any Euclidean space simply because Z3 cannot be embedded as well. Okay, so this was uh, the discussion about quasi arcs. And now go to quasi conformal trees, which is the interesting part. Now, the bilipsis embeddability of quasi conformal trees is interesting because quasi conformal trees are standing between two types of spaces with completely different behavior. On one hand, quasi conformal trees generalize quasi arcs, and I just proved to you, well, I didn't quite prove it, but I stated that quasi arcs admit embeddings. And on the other hand, quasi conformal trees are a special case of uh, a collection of metric spaces known as doubling graphs, which contain laxographs, which do not admit an embedding. So graphs in general don't admit embeddings, quasi arcs admit embeddings. What happens with quasi conformal trees? So it looks that it can go either way. Now, there is some indication, though, that it more leans towards to the embedding parts. Um, namely, uh, Gupta, Krauss, Gamma, and Lee proved that if you have a geodesic doubling tree, uh, which is um, a tree with finite as one dimension, and uh, it's a geodesic space, then you can embed it in some Euclidean space. But although this is a positive result in the direction of embedding quasi-conformal trees, uh, 
we have to know that's also very far because geodesic Dublin trees are uh, in a sense, the straightest trees that are, they have no, they exhibit no fractal behavior at all, okay? Uh, as soon as you have a little bit of fractal behavior, like a snowflake, uh, snowflake uh, segments, then this is no longer a geodesic tree. So geodesic trees are complicated from a topological point of view, but they're very nice from a geometric point of view. Then with um, Guy Davids, two years ago, we proved that uh, if you can embed the leaves of a quasi-conformal tree, then you can embed the tree itself. Um, so the leaves of the tree are just all the points that if you remove them, the set remains connected. And again, uh, this is another indication that quasi-conformal trees admit some embedding, but also very far from the actual result because there are trees that the leaves are dense in this tree. So let me give you an example. Consider of the following three here. So you have this segment and then this segment, and then you add two smaller ones here, and then you add two smaller ones here, and so on and so forth, and you keep adding smaller and smaller segments, then you will get a quasi-conformal tree uh, for which the set of leaves is dense in the tree. And that theorem doesn't give you much. It tells you that the tree can be embedded if and only if the tree can be embedded. But fortunately, last year we were able to prove the full results. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Guy David and Sylvester Erickson Bick, uh, where we proved that every quasi conformal tree actually by ellipsisly embeds in some Euclidean space. And as I said, I, I'm not going to talk about proofs, but roughly the idea is very similar to the Aswad embedding theorem. You want to chop a quasi conformal tree uh, in a clever way and this is uh, all uh, Sylvester's uh, ingenious cutting here. You can cut it into a, 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 sort, a certain collection of tiles. You know that you can embed every tile in some Euclidean space, and then you want to patch these embeddings in a correct way. And that patching will yield um, the embedding if you can tile it carefully. So, um, with that, I will finish and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.